Oh, hello. Yes, this is the Sidewinder X1 from Artillery, or so named Ev Novo at this time. I prepared a first impressions video for you, and we filmed it the other day. Sean edited it together. It looks great. And then I set off to do a print, and it failed, and it clogged, and I haven't been able to print anything since. So the video is really good, and I really, really want you to see it. So you'll get a chance to do that. But then at some point, we really need to talk about this. So with that in mind, on with the show. Hey, it's Joel. You know, here on the channel, we get a lot of machines in to test and use. Unfortunately, there isn't an unlimited amount of time. So I finally found time. I got the artillery weight, the Evnovo Sidewinder X1 out of the box put together. I've got some test prints done and we're gonna talk about my first impressions and whether or not you should spend your hard earned money on this machine right here on 3D Printing Nerd. Ah, welcome back. Uh, again, this is the artillery, wait, no, the Evnovo Sidewinder X1. Originally, when this was sent to me, it was Artillery 3D, and they had the Sidewinder X1. And then at some point, they changed their name from Artillery to Evnovo, because I believe there were issues sending something through customs that was labeled artillery. I would imagine that might prevent some some people from receiving their packages in certain countries. But as far as I can tell, lots of people have gotten their machines and lots of people love their machines. Let's talk about if I love this machine. How was that segue? Was that good? That's a, that's a great segue. That a I, loved, segue? I loved it. That was it. a good segue. The Sidewinder X1 is a typical machine. It's got the moving bed and it's got the gantry that the print head moves up. So along the X and Y, it is 300 millimeters for the build size and on the Z, or Z, it's 400 millimeters on the build size. If that sounds familiar, that's because that's the build volume of the CR10. And uh, if you know the CR10 build volume, you know this. It's a direct drive extruder, and the extruder is an E3D Titan style extruder. And below that, you've got an E3D Volcano compatible hot end. And I say those words because I don't think they're E3D original pieces, or if they are, I am mistaken. It takes 1.75 millimeter filament, and it'll print all your favorite filaments, no doubt. The bed surface is a, I don't know, it's, I believe it's glass with a, with a covering. It's similar, you've played with Ultra Base, right, Sean? Yes, I have. Yeah, it's similar to Ultra Base and things seem to adhere to it pretty well. On the bottom, you can see, well, I guess you can't see it's in the back, but look at this. There are two motors for Z and at the top, a belt synchronizes them to make sure they're going at the same rate so that your, <laughs> your X axis doesn't tilt. All of the electronics are kept inside this case at the bottom and the power cord comes out the back. If you turn it on, it beeps. Did it come up, the Joel? Do you oh, see the Joel? Oh, it's a Joel bot. Oh, Joel? Yeah, my buddy Eddie did that for me. The firmware is available. It's MKS Gen L, I believe, and it's a touch screen, which is MKS TFT. The printer's on right now. It's actually really quiet, and surprisingly, it's quiet during printing as well. The assembly of this printer was pretty easy. I actually got it done in about 10 minutes one evening. I did run into some issues, though, because two of the parts weren't proper and I had to do with the ends that go into the extrusion that you screw and tighten parts to. This one finally grabbed and was able to go in. This one spun freely. I tightened the other one. There's two screws that go into each of the motors to mount it to the extrusion and I tightened the other one really tight and it's not moving. I shouldn't have any problems with it but again during install that was really the only thing that that happened uh when i first set it up the printer actually had some problems with leveling it's a manual leveling process because it has the four points to level and the touch screen will lead you through which points that you level upon but uh, I was having some problems because it couldn't maintain the level and I figured out one of the couplers in the back was loose as well. So once I tightened that up, everything was good to go and it's maintained level and done test prints and so far, I'm pretty happy with the results. Let me show you why. In order to get kind of a first impressions on this machine, I wanted to throw a few different prints at it. Something that I could, I could print uh, consistently across other machines because I wanna get some first impressions on other machines as well. First one was the decoration cube. You've recently seen that featured on a previous video. This machine was able to reproduce it incredibly well. This is Matter Hacker's Build Series PLA. This was printed using Filament Frenzy's 
Prusa Slicer profile for this machine, and it, it did a fantastic job. It looks great. It's not wiggly. Uh, the lines are straight. The top of uh, the surface right here is good. I mean, the bottom's good because it came. It's stuck to the build plate. This this is good. This is how it should look. So this is this is a pass. I like this. Next, I printed the Wexter Mini Joel, and I had an issue with it. If you can, do you see right there, the glasses? I do. You see right there? It missed that, and I missed it in the slicer originally, so I went back and looked, and the slicer was configured with a, a filament extrusion width of 0.46, which when you print with PLA, you know, PLA does, ex it can expand a little bit, so when printing, sometimes you just specify a larger extrusion width. That's why it missed this, because this part is too small for a 0.46 filament extrusion width. So what I did is I went into the slicer and I changed a few things, and even though it was done, it did really well on this, I knew I could fine tune it just a little more, and I was able to print out Mini Joel again, and uh, how does that look? Complete. It looks complete. Both are of high quality, but this one, I believe, has more of the detail because I was able to print at a smaller extrusion width. Yeah, the important part is the Joel crotch, though. How does it look? Oh, well, you know, that's not, that's a good Joel crotch right there. Yeah. It turned out really good. No sagging, no drooping. Everything's where it should be. It looks symmetrical. It looks symmetrical. That's really the highest compliment anyone can pay is if you look symmetrical. So there we go. The Wexter Mini Joel is one of the models that I'll use for first impressions, and it printed, well, incredibly well. Next, uh, my buddy Chuck. You know him from the Film at Friday. Uh, he has himself a little pawn, so I printed the Chuck pawn. Uh, it's got some sidewalls, so you can look at extrusions, and it's got this ball at the top. It's got some top layers in space. It's a decent test model, and I know he's printed really big. I printed it default size, and uh, Sean, it looks pretty good. It's great that you can get that good of a finish, I guess, on uh, a build volume that's, you know, huge. Right, right. The, the detail is great. And I think that you always worry with direct drive of the weight of the extruder, because if it's doing any sort of fast movements, like with this, it's going to miss, well, mislay down the filament because it's so heavy and it's throwing itself around, but it's fairly light. The belts are nice and tight and uh, it produced a great model. I mean, look at, the t look at the top. Usually you will see printers that cannot print the top of the pawn and it looks great. This is a wonderful model and I'm glad I printed that. We did go with some of the Floalistic uh, 3D printed chain mail and um, I thought I did a really good job. I thought it did a really, really good job. It's not perfect. You can kind of see how there's some spots that, that the extrusion missed. Oh yeah. Uh, also, I don't believe my first layer is perfectly calibrated because some of the bottom pieces were stuck together. I just I just used a little bit of force and pulled them apart. But other than that, um, it, it, did, it did do this well. So I would consider this a success. I know it can be done better, but for a machine I'm just trying to get used to, I think it did a good job. Uh, when a machine is laying down the filament for this 3D printable chain mail, it has to do a lot of retractions and a lot of, if you have it enabled, Z hops and just, just putting down tiny little dots of filament everywhere. So how it works is there's, um, there's bridging and there's these, uh, there's these little filament risers, I'm going to call them. So the, the bridges lay across these, these little columns and uh, they interlock. And so those columns are super duper tiny. And so the printer just has to go and go mm, 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 just a little bit at a time. It, it's crazy that it's able to do that and it's able to do that consistently. And like I said, this isn't perfect, but I'm considering this a very, a very successful print. And I think with some slight tuning using the slicing engine, I would get it even better. So I'm gonna consider that a success. Oh, and the green is the Repcord green filament. My buddy, my buddy Pooch sent that over. So I was able to use that as well. And uh, it printed that just fine. So lastly, I wanted to get something that took a while to print. That was multiple pieces that would fit together. Something that would maybe have trouble sticking to the build plate. This is a, a planter. I printed this larger and you saw me and Anibal Trades fill it with dirt and rescue a plant, which is alive to this day in that room right it's, over there. It's giant now. It's pretty giant. But the idea was to print this with a lot of perimeters because I wanted it to be almost solid, if not solid plastic. I wanted it to be watertight or close to watertight and I wanted it to fit into itself. So that fit just fine. It was on the build plate like this and this did not tip over and the bottom is, well here, look at the bottom. That looks pretty good, doesn't it? it looks great, yeah, look at that, wow. 
It looks like the build plate heat may have affected the first, I don't know, five millimeters or so. But for something like this, a functional print, that really doesn't matter. Uh, the cooling, you can see, so on the underside right here, you'll see it kind of dive in a little bit. Uh, typically, you'll see this have some problems in it because the printer can't cool the filament fast enough or it's not able to lay it down at speed and cool it down fast enough. I think this is cool though because if I use this as a model to get some first impressions of machines it means I could technically then put dirt and plant and then give them away as gifts. Sure yeah that's good like Christmas gifts or something. For people or, or you don't, housewarming for Sean. For people you don't like. Oh, well, <laughs> maybe not. So this is successful. I'm going to consider that a success. Let's talk about some of the things, though, I didn't like about the machine because it's not perfect, right? This green bit right here is a plug because when they first manufactured these machines, there is a giant space around where the USB port and the SD card holder are. And that giant space is big enough to fit an SD card. And so there are there were three times, specifically three times, I remember putting the SD card in and then going, wait, oh, it's in the hole, and then putting it in where it should be. So this is a little cover for the holes and it's available on Thingiverse. And it was like a, it was like a four minute print, but it gave me peace of mind knowing that I'm not gonna shove the SD card into the base. <laughs> Newer versions of this machine have the sheet metal cut to to a proper spacing, so you're not gonna shove the SD card down in there. That's good. You do have the option of using a provided USB stick to transfer your files to the machine. However, we have noticed a problem and we can't seem to figure it out. If you are printing with G-code on the USB stick, for some reason, as you're producing the skirt for a print, it will send the extruder off into a weird angle. It's weird, it goes to produce the skirt, it stops extruding, and then it just moves the extruder out into a triangle, back, and then it goes back to its spot and it starts extruding again. And it does it every time I print from the USB stick. Weird. It's the weirdest thing. Uh, one time my nozzle was too low and I did scratch my bed in the shape of a triangle. So if someone smarter than me is out there, there's many of you, you can figure this out. Please let me know because I would love to be able to fix that. One of the other features this machine has is a filament detection sensor and it's bolted to the spool holder. Here's the other side of the spool holder and each one is held into the extrusion with two screws. The problem this presents is if I have filament spools that are this size and then I want to go to something that's slightly bigger or I want to go have this size and I want to go to something that's slightly smaller. It is incredibly difficult to make sure or always have on high uh, have on hand some sort of uh, hex wrench to get back there and loosen something and then move it and then tighten it back up and then get to printing. I think this is unfortunately a very bad spool holder situation and I'm sure with this machine all you have to do is mount this off the side somewhere and print yourself a new spool holder. I had an idea where if I could have it kind of this far apart and then put roller bars in between and then no matter the filament roll size I put on there it should be able to handle it. I'll let you know if I get that done. And finally the last thing I want to mention about this machine that I think probably uh, needs attention is this right here. This is the cable that goes into the bed and there is no strain relief right there. It doesn't look like it does too much bending but again little bits of bending over lots of movements can create failures and I think that something that tightens that down should be standard. Again this is an earlier machine so they may have it by now but on these earlier machines they didn't have it so that should be something you address. You do get spare parts for the machine. It's using a ribbon cable here and a ribbon cable here and as far as I can tell this is proper use for these I believe correct me if I'm wrong and it, they're not introducing stress into the system and they should last a while but you do get replacements just in case. You also have roller wheels, some zip ties, a USB cord. So this right here it's a RGB LED and when you turn this on there's a light that shines out the bottom. I don't know so there's white you can turn it off white, red, green, or blue. I mean, it doesn't make the machine go any faster, but it's kind of neat to be able to custom control the color out of the LED and they give you a replacement just in case. Well, I guess with all the prints we've talked about, I, I think we should talk about this machine and whether or not I think you should spend your money on it. And it comes down to yes. Yes, I, I think you should. Ah, it's yes, but with an asterisk. Let me explain. The printer is apart right now because I had a massive jam 
a couple different times. This was gonna be Deadpool. Deadpool is not complete, Deadpool is sad. These parts here were also supposed to be Deadpool and they, they jammed too. The problem was it didn't feel like a typical nozzle jam. I didn't feel a blockage. It just felt extremely difficult to push the filament through the hot end. And I think I know the reason for that. This is not an all metal hot end. This is a hot end that contains a PTFE liner. In a typical hot end setup, you've got the nozzle, you've the heater block, and then you've got the heat break. And then above that, you've got the heat sink. So with this hot end, you've got the nozzle, you've got the heater block. You also have a heat break right here. And then usually you have some sort of heat sink up here. This doesn't have that. When a nozzle in combination is all metal, that means from the tip to the end, it's, it's metal and you can increase the temperature quite a bit. And that's how you get up to 300 C and above. However, with a hot end like this, you have a PTFE lining that goes all the way to the nozzle, which means you're limited by the temperature at which PTFE can survive. And that's usually, well, that's usually, you don't wanna go above 237 C. I think PTFE will survive to 240 C, 242 C. I think something like that, but 237 C gets you a good buffer. And crappy PTFE isn't going to require such a higher temperature to break down, and it's just gonna break down with the heat. And unfortunately, it's a crappy piece of PTFE tubing in this machine. So here's what I did. Here's the old tubing. Here is some new tubing from Capricorn. And they have, well, it's the world's finest 3D printer Bowden tube extruded from the highest quality PTFE. So there you go. It should withstand temperatures a little bit better and usually uh, holds up longer in a hot end like this. So what I need to do is put this right into here and then get it back into that system right there. And then we should, we should be able to start a Deadpool print again. I'll be right back. A few moments later. You got it? Just about. Now that's a spool holder. There we go. The printer is up and going again. So what we did is we took apart the hot end and we put in a new PTFE tube. Well, here, you can kind of, let's see. So this one right here, the black one, you can tell the inner diameter, super tiny, filled with icky filament, and you can tell it stopped it up. The Capricorn PTFE tube though, this side, nice and wide and open and easily letting filament go through. So this is what we put in there, and hopefully this is what's gonna work. So now we need to discuss the asterisk. So in the original recording, I said, yes, I would recommend you spend your hard-earned money on a machine like this. I actually talked about Amazon and how the link to Amazon has it for $419 US. I know there's an AliExpress store as well that has this. But with this new information, this failure that happened, would I still recommend it? Yes, asterisk, because there's a caveat now. I, I would recommend this, and my original indication of it being for tinkerers or someone who's technical in nature still holds true because this is a platform and a tool all at the same time. It's a tool because it's gonna get stuff done, and it's a platform because it's upgradable. You can do things to it. You can print out a new little cover. You can print out a spool holder. You can print out a new fan duct. There's all sorts of really great things you can do. But as a tool and as a platform, it performs so far pretty well. We did have a hiccup with the PTFE tube. They included a replacement. I chose not to use that and used a premium product. We'll see how it goes. But for now, if you're interested in something like this, there's gonna be links down in the description for you to take a look at. Um, I thought this was fair because I didn't wanna just leave it as a recommendation. This happened. It was after filming, but this still happened. And I wanted to make sure you knew about it. So I hope this was valuable and I hope it inspired you to look a little closer at things that may just need a little bit of TLC before they work great. And by the time this video goes to air, this Deadpool should be a larger one. And uh, I'm not gonna make Sean uh, put a picture right there. Just show the picture, Sean. If it, I hope it's ready. I hope the picture's ready. And I hope it looks good. <sighs> With that, don't forget to hug each other more. And I love you all, as always. High five.